Suffering is such an it's a huge topic, right? I mean, it's one that you can never totally explain, a mystery that you can never totally explain. Without faith, like su both of these things that we're talking about in this episode, really suffering and death, are these, these great tragedies. And it's really, it's, it's hard to find any source of, of light or goodness in the midst of them without mm -hmm. the eyes of faith. And yet, uh, Elizabeth, as she's going through this, so this isn't just some, uh, like, ideal in her mind that um, she's living it. It's very different, you know, to when you're living the pain to be able to, to experience and say these things. And yet she's really able to, um, to, to develop this spirituality and, and find meaning in the midst of, of her suffering. Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome back to another episode of CarmelCast. CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, you can visit our website at www.icspublications.org. And we're, we're back with our seventh and final episode of this season that we're doing on St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. And so in this episode, we're really going to dive into the last couple of years of her life. Um, we spent the first two episodes were more biographical, and then we've uh, the last few episodes we've done have been more thematic. And now we're going to go back into uh, more more biographical of these last last the last days of her suffering and her death. I'm Brother John Mary of Jesus Crucified, and I'm joined today by Father Pier Giorgio of Christ the King. This is, I think, uh, a very relevant topic for for everyone in the world because if there's anything that's true, then we will all die at some point mm -hmm. and also i think we all suffer and so this is something that elizabeth has she has something to teach us yeah i think with respect to particularly when we think of young saints the saints who died when they were young um there's maybe this tendency to to kind of shy away from that part of their life and just to kind of focus on their holiness and to see how much they were able to uh how much how much they were able to um, divest themselves of of the world at such a young age and um what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of that work had to be fraught in the midst of suffering. And it's something that, um, you know, we, we never want to compare one suffering with another's, uh, but it's something that's, that's uniquely one's own. And so something that comes at the end of each of our lives and throughout our lives as well. But it's a place where we're also uniquely united with Christ. It's something, I mean, we see living in the monastery, right? We live with, with men who are in their 80s and 90s, and we see... Um, physically they're they're slowing down and and it's really this preparation for for eternal life they're really they're becoming saints before our eyes they're 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 faced with those fears they're letting go of those things that they've been holding on to all their lives so um it really is a beautiful time in anyone's life but i'd say particularly in the life of, of a saint yeah and it's really we have um such 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 depth of writing coming from saint elizabeth at this time because of um well, she had a hard time speaking during this time in her life, and so it allowed her to write quite a bit. Um, you know, if you compare her to someone like St. Therese, most of what we have about her life at the end of her life was written down by her, her sisters, particularly Mother Agnes. And um, here, most of what we have about Elizabeth is written by in her own hand. Yeah, so maybe just to recall, because we've been away from the biography for a few weeks, so mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth entered the, the karma when she was 21 years old. And then um, she, th by the time she starts to begin the symptoms of her illness, she's, I think, 25. Mm -hmm. So she's lived a short time um, in Carmel. I mean, those years, there's, there's plenty in there as well with her own, um, some of her own darkness during her novitiate and, you know, plenty of, of, of purification and uh, writing that she did right. during that time as well. Um, but these last year and a half, two years of her life really are, uh, bore a lot of fruit. And so the, the, we see kind of those first symptoms perhaps of her illness um, in 1905, and that's when she's 25 years old. At that time, um, one of her jobs was working as the, the turn sister. So she had to do a lot of, run, run a lot of errands because the turn sister, sister's there. She's working um, at the turn, which is the kind of the entryway into the monastery where they can receive things and, and put things out. And so she's having to do a lot of running errands, getting people, carrying things. Um, and so 
this is the first time that really she began to notice that she's she's extremely fatigued mm -hmm. and that's kind of the first symptom of i think of her illness yeah and, and you know at this point as with most illnesses we don't really know what's going on and the severity of it and um you know a young person um you know maybe getting fatigued i think your first your first instinct as probably mother germaine was like well you probably need some more rest or something like that and and not really taking you know into consideration that it might be something more serious um, but, uh, and I don't know that Elizabeth even had a sense of, of this, you know, being the illness that would, that would culminate her life a year later. Right. And well, Elizabeth, um, trying to practice virtue too, she was not vocal about her struggles yeah. here. She wasn't going to complain about being tired. So she was ex experiencing this fatigue for a long time before, um, anyone would even know about it. And her prioress would maybe have a little further insight because Elizabeth would speak to her more frankly about her realities. Um, so yeah, like you said, her privacy probably just had, you know, some suspicions that maybe she needed more rest or that, you know, she needed to, to slow down on some things. Um, but slowly this progressed throughout this year of 1905. And then um, finally in, in August of 1905 is when it became very clear, so much so that Elizabeth was no longer able to hide uh, her fatigue. It became much more clear to her community. I think they was said that um, she was just even sitting at the, the table eating, you know, her supper. And it's like she could hardly move. And so everyone was aware, like, okay, this is something more serious than just get a little more rest. And so that's when they, they called in the doctor for the first time to, to check her out. Yeah, I think at this time, you know, in, in the fall of 1905, she's, um, yeah, it's becoming more apparent that she's not herself um, with respect to her 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 bodily self. And, and she probably looks quite a bit different. She doesn't probably look as as young as she probably did before. And, and so she's starting to become symptomatic, essentially. And so this is what, um, you know, begins the, the kind of the diagnosis process of like, okay, what's going on here? That uh, what's, is there something more serious? Is, is there something that is going to be more debil debilitating for her? Right. It's a, it's a good reminder to me reading about this because, again, the other sisters would have had very little insight into this because Elizabeth was trying so hard to hide it. But um, I don't know. I mean, how often do we experience those in our daily lives who just seem maybe a little tired or like they're not moving as quickly? And we our reaction is to be impatient with them. Yeah. Uh, not always like knowing the insight of like, well, what's really happening in this person's life? So it's just a good reminder for me, too, of like, OK, you don't always know what's going on. Someone might be, in, you know, facing something very serious when I just think they're being lazy. Right. Yeah, no, I think the difference the difference that we always have to bear in mind is that uh, we, we often see kind of our own frustrations in other people. So, okay, this person is frustrating me, so they must they must be annoyed with me or something like that too. So there can always be this, also be this kind of like, well, you know, what did I do wrong sort of thing too that can happen in community life too, which I'm sure was, was uh, a part of this whole dynamic as well. Right, yeah. And so they, they call in the doctor then, and um, it's interesting because, I mean, the, the doctor sees Elizabeth and he sees, okay, she's experiencing weakness, um, extreme exhaustion, and then some stomach pain. Mm -hmm. uh, but apart from that, he, he doesn't really know what's, what's happening. So right. he, he prescribed, you know, rest and fresh air, which is, you know, almost nothing, it seems <laughs> like. Um, but he's, 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 yeah, he's kind of mystified. He's not sure what's, what's happening. Maybe the same as, as what Mother Germain might have thought at first is like, just get some more rest and yeah. we'll see if you bounce back. Yeah, and I think I think that I mean, what what more can you really expect at at this stage with you, you as, as a doctor coming to see a young nun? Um, you know, it's there's there's probably uh, a multitude of things that it, of prognosis or, or diagnosis that it might be, mm -hmm. but it's it's almost like well, more likely it's than not, it's just something that she needs to just kind of rest through. Yes. Yeah. Well, and and so it's interesting because we know now um, that Elizabeth. Pretty, pretty much, we know almost certainly that she had Addison's disease, which mm -hmm. at that time was almost unknown in France. So even if the doctor had been like very up to date with things, he probably wouldn't have been able to di diagnose this in her. Um, but it wasn't until 60 years after her death that finally a doctor went in and examined all of the, the details of her case and, and gave a diagnosis of Ag Addison's disease. Um, and I mean, Addison's disease is a disease of the adrenal gland, adrenal glands. And um, so before the time of these, 
the drugs that we have today, uh, it would have been incurable anyway. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't much that they could do except for manage the symptoms that St. Elizabeth was, was experiencing at that time. Right. Uh, Addison's disease is an uh, autoimmune disease. So it, even today, it's something that's more difficult to diagnose and probably wouldn't be diagnosable without significant blood work and, and labs and things like that. It essentially, it, 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 it reduces, and then I think eventually the adrenal glands fail, mm -hmm. and so it is no longer they're no longer able to produce cortisol, which right. is an important um, it's an it's an important bodily chemical that helps us to regulate so much. It it uh, regulates inflammation and it, it it helps with the with the digestion of glucose, and mm -hmm. so um, it, it's a lot of this sort of um, you know the the actual things that was going wrong with her body were manifesting themselves in sort of related sort of core morbidity sort of stuff that you get when you can't digest glucose and things yeah. like that, which would be more stomach issues and and uh, loss of appetite and things like that. Right. I mean, it seems like one of the main things that it was affecting her at the beginning here was her metabolism. It was mm -hmm. slowing down her metabolism so, such that she was experiencing these symptoms of fatigue. Um, and then, you know, eventually as it would progress, as you mentioned, the inflammation, uh, stomach ulceration, uh, headaches, insomnia, like these are all the symptoms that Elizabeth would eventually experience. But here at the beginning, um, at this time, it was really just the fatigue. And then I think the beginnings of the, the stomach issues, um, but that would just continue, you know, the, the rest and fresh air didn't seem to be, be helping much as far as, as curing this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think the other thing that it would begin to see things would be more serious is that she would, another symptom of Addison's disease is because of the inability to, um, you know, break down glucose is it's going to, it's going to really take a, a shot to your, uh, to your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, she would experience fainting spells and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and within the context of community life, that can be something that's very dramatic, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it's interesting again, because uh, Elizabeth had some kind of premonition, even by the end of that year, by the end of 1905, she had some some idea that she was going to die, even though at this time, others really had, had no sense that she was very seriously ill because she was able to put on a smiling face. She was able mm -hmm. still to get around the monastery. She was able to go to the times of prayer. Um, yet she knew that something was coming. So like the first example of that is uh, there's a story of, I think shortly before Christmas, she was uh, arranging the the infant Jesus in the crib uh, and and um, she was looking down at the child Jesus and one of the sisters heard her say uh, say to the, the 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 infant Jesus well my little king of love we'll see each other uh, closer up next year mm -hmm. and so this other nun was a little shocked by <laughs> hearing her say this but but Elizabeth seemed to have some sense that that her end was coming I think yeah that, that's she understood more than anyone the the state of her own her own will and desires as well and so i think this this would um you know lead her to to think well you have a, probably more of a resignation about your own living being mm -hmm. at at a point when you're suffering and and uh, at a point such as her with great holiness you know mm -hmm. she's she's ready to go you know she's she's she doesn't uh she's not eager to live um you know more experiences and and um you know she's she's her will is is moving closer and closer to the will of God. And really, we've seen from from early on in her life this great desire for heaven, uh, which was increasing um, as she got closer, I think, to heaven. And maybe the the other nuns just thought this was kind of wishful thinking. And that that's what you know. Another story shortly after that is on New Year's, the the nuns would take turns drawing different saints that would be kind of their patron saint for the year. Mm. And uh, Saint Elizabeth drew Saint Joseph. Um, who's the patron saint of a, a good death, of a holy death. And so she was, of course, ecstatic <laughs> at drawing St. Joseph. Um, and, and she said, he's coming to fetch me. He's coming to take me away to the Father. Yeah. And the other nun's like, no, no, no. Like, you know, again, it's just wishful thinking. But she says, you'll see. I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's this aspect of, and she would, have a, she would have a good death, but it would be one maybe that she wasn't expecting, you know, at this point she never understood exactly what was going on. And uh, there were times within this next few months where things would get better, things would get worse. Mm -hmm. And so it was these ups and downs um, towards the end, it would become a lot of suffering. Yeah. Um, and so a good death, certainly a holy death, certainly, um, but not one that was, that was lacking any, any share, any, any few less share of, of the cross. That, yes, exactly. That not, an, <laughs> not an easy death at yeah. all. Um, yeah. And that's really kind of what I, I think why it's good to even discuss this period 
this next, you know, this last year of her life then is because it was a death that eventually would be just so conformed to Christ. Mm -hmm. That's where it's like the trajectory of Elizabeth's life here. And especially in these last few years is like, um, she is is diminishing and and christ is is all that's left like shining forth in her bodily suffering is something that um you know it it can change us and transform us quite a bit because of of how much it is a sharing in in the life of jesus mm-hmm. um and as a young as a young woman twenty five and twenty six during this time uh, something that she, of course, she had a lot of suffering in her life with respect to um, emotional and, and 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 mourning and loss and things like that and wounds as we all do, um, but probably hadn't experienced much bodily suffering beyond you know we we know of the time when she couldn't kneel because she was kneeling too much and she had water in the knee and these things. But yeah. um, you know something that we can't we can't uh, discount is is how much um, this experience of, of profound and deep suffering would would uh, assist her in in growing closer to God. And it seems like the first time that she had the, the real sense of what this this was going to be her path was that, that very next Lent. Um, so, you know, this is New Year's of 1906 when she draws the name of St. Joseph, and then that coming Lent is when um, she really has this sense of, of that she's going to share in, in the suffering of Christ. Um, and at that time, too, her physical suffering is, is her physical um Health is declining even more, such that eventually the prioress has to, you know, begin dispensing her of some of the times of prayer, and like really, she's um, becoming more and more debilitated as mm-hmm. far as what she's able to do. Um, but she's still able to function somewhat in in community. But um, but yeah, it was it was kind of walking this that first Lent uh, of uh, when she was sick was kind of walking that path with Christ of suffering. And she wouldn't even make it through Lent with respect to, uh, it would be during Lent that she would be moved right. into the infirmary. Yeah. And that's a great, great, uh, uh, well, I guess God's providence and that it was just, I think a few days before the feast day of St. Joseph, it was mm-hmm. leading up to the feast day of St. Joseph that she really began to get extremely sick. Um, and so I think the feast of St. Joseph was actually the very last day, uh, that she had in the community. So mm-hmm. again, we see, St. Joseph right there, kind of leading her through this. Um, and so then that's when she, she you know, she, she becomes un- unable to live in the community normally and she enters the infirmary. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to maybe to talk a little bit about the, the situation in the infirmary because there's, um, you know, she, because of that, of where she was and the proximity that it was to within the monastery um, and even some of the sisters who, Maybe she didn't have, she wasn't as close with uh, up until this point. It would kind of change a little bit of, the, of her own community dynamic. So it's not like as she, if she were, um, you know, I think a lot of people when they think of nun in the, a nun in the in the um, infirmary, we think of Saint Therese, and mm-hmm. that was a little, probably a little bit of a different situation just because of the fact that Therese had three of her sisters and a cousin living in the <laughs> convent with her, and so right. it was a constant sort of community coming in and, and, and seeing and, and conversing with her. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas for Elizabeth, it would be a situation where, um, you know, she would come into contact with, with some sisters that she maybe didn't have as much, you know, relational opportunity with. Mm-hmm. Well, and the the main constant, though, I think through this was Mother Germaine, the prioress, who was, you know, so close to Elizabeth during, from the, her time of first entering, even before she entered Carmel, the one who kind of helped her, uh, formed her. And then she's the one who here in the infirmary is, you know, daily visiting. Um, and that's something, you know, yeah, I, I think we're, we're used to at least somewhat from our own monastery, like what an infirmary would be like and, and for the nuns as well. But um, maybe, maybe others listening wouldn't have any sense. I know in our, you know, in our monastery in DC, we have a, um, a room that overlooks the chapel mm-hmm. um, that would have been used, you know, for us, if their brother was sick, then he could stay in that room. There's uh, a bathroom there in that room. And then also he can uh, there's like windows that like open up and then you can look down onto the sanctuary. So there's a way for you to, even from your bed or at least sitting in a chair in your room to kind of participate to some degree in the life of the community. Mm-hmm. And that's something similar that Elizabeth would have had, um, but still very far from from being, you know, in the midst of the community like she was before. Right, right. Yeah, and I think even with respect to Mother Germain during this time, you know, it was there was a a growing in, in closeness between the two of them mm-hmm. um, because, you know, maybe they had a lot of contact with one another throughout the day and in, in the normal course of a day in the monastery. 
Um, but now here's a reason for Mother Germain to come and check in. And as a prioress, you know, to be the mother of, of one of her daughters who was ill mm-hmm. and one whom she, you know, deeply admired and respected and, and, and loved. Um, right maybe more, more on a personal level than, than just, um, kind of any other nun in the monastery, maybe right. even. Yeah. And so the, the infirmary here was, I mean, it's kind of a, was in a separate part of the monastery from the rest of the rooms, but, mm-hmm. you know, still connected in the same building there. Um, and then there was another nun who was in the infirmary, uh, at the time of Elizabeth as well. Um, but still there was enough privacy that it seemed like, I mean, Elizabeth had her own space. She could have her own conversations with mother Germaine. Um, so there was some, some sense of, of privacy, but also I'd say apart from, you know, those few sisters, that was kind of her community mm-hmm. during that time. She may have seen the other nuns sometimes, but it wasn't nearly as, as often as on this regular basis. Yeah. There was one other uh, sister there who was, had kind of like this hypochondriac sort of symptoms as well that she was not symptoms, but she was kind of a hypochondriac and mm-hmm. was always thinking that she was dying. And so she would be kind of trickling in and out during this time as well. Right. Um, one of her biographers not- notices uh, that no- notes that this sister would, would end up dying too, but 37 years later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Elizabeth enters, you know, there on the Feast of St. Joseph, she enters this, the infirmary or the day after that. And then she has like her first kind of serious attack on Palm Sunday. Mm-hmm. This is the, you know, the time when, um, you know, the beginning of Christ's kind of entry into uh, the Holy Week and his passion and death too. And so Elizabeth's sharing in that in some way. And in this attack, um, she faints, she loses consciousness for several hours. I mean, they think it's her last moments. They yeah. call the priest. Right. The priest comes to, you know, give her these last rites. And by this time, she's at least conscious again. Um, but um, they still, they, they think that this is the end for her. Right. So it must have been so serious enough that they inform even Elizabeth's family, mm-hmm. uh, her sister Geet, her mother, Madame Catez, and to let, let them know that something's happening yeah. um, and, and, to, and to at least make them aware uh, of, of, of what's going on. Yeah. And so this is real serious, like, you know, beginning of Holy Week. And uh, they're thinking, you know, these are her final days. And then suddenly, like... On Holy Saturday, right before Easter Sunday, like Elizabeth comes out of this and she's, um, I mean, not, not in great health, but she's at least like upright again. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the fear of her suddenly dying is, is over now. Right, right. So it just, it's a beautiful, you know, this, this Lent, she's able really to enter into the, the passion, death and, and resurrection of Jesus too, to share some uh, in that experience and in her own physical body. Yeah, and I think we can relate to this on many levels. You know, we all have these seasons in our life where maybe Lent's a little bit more more real this year um, mm-hmm. because of maybe you have a loss in the family or because of um, some change, significant change uh, within life, maybe the loss of a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's these times that we all go through where we can, where the seasons of the church maybe even have a, more of a profound meaning. Um, and this certainly was an opportunity for, for Elizabeth. And I think it ought to teach us something that we ought to, um, not take for granted even the even the, the difficult things, the things about our life that we would rather not have happened, mm-hmm. uh, as, an, as maybe a way to to unite more fully into the mysteries uh, that are going on in the midst of of the church year or in the midst of our faith. Right, even if it's the the suffering comes not during Holy Week but during <laughs> Christmas or whatever right. it might be, like it's an invitation to enter into that Holy Week experience still. Yeah, uh, those days of of. Uh, yeah, the, the days of Christ's suffering, we can unite ourselves to those at any time. Yeah. So another thing that's happening that's very interesting at this time is um, kind of just the dynamics. And this happens so often, you know, when someone's sick or dying. But there's these complications, these dynamics where there's, um, you know, Mother Germaine and the community, they're trying to do all that they can to care for Elizabeth. But those outside of the convent are kind of talking amongst themselves. And they think that maybe Elizabeth's not receiving good treatment. They're just letting her die and they're upset about it. And I mean, how, how realistic is this to, yeah. to experience this today when, when someone is, is either very seriously ill or is dying? I think most families can, can point to a time within their, their family existence where something like this has happened, whether it be one, one of the siblings of, of a dying parent is, um, um, kind of more absent or, or taking less, less being, being less uh, concerned about things or maybe more, um, in, in denial in that sense. And so mm-hmm. maybe we, we blame certain things about them. And so we can imagine this in our own life and, and things that, how this has happened in our own lives to, to maybe what's going on within the context between the Carmel of Dijon and Elizabeth's family. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, in particular, her brother-in-law, um, Geet's husband, would yeah. be um, someone who would get you know upset and angry about um, you know what what do these doctors know and um, are they really sending the best care? And so he would actually even arrange for 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 his own doctor's uh, specialist, uh, a specialist recommended by his doctor, to come in and actually you know, give a real diagnosis, so to speak. Yeah. And it's actually, again, in, in God's providence that all this happens because we have these other specialists that come in at different times and examine Elizabeth. And um, thanks to that, we have their witnesses, which mm-hmm. is something really beautiful too, because we have, you know, all these doctors that saw Elizabeth during these times. And I'd say one of the main uh, things that a lot, that seems like several of them notice is just like her, her peace and serenity in the face of great suffering. Mm -hmm. So those in the community maybe wouldn't know exactly like the pain that she's going through and how difficult it would be. Yet here, these doctors, they know, um, they're examining her up close and they see like, she's going through so much pain. And yet she's able to sit here, put on a smile and like, ask me how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um, She's able to, to not turn in on herself, herself, which is always the focus when we're suffering, and which never helps to alleviate the suffering turning in on ourselves. that's our tendency, our temptation. And yet Elizabeth's able really to, to do the opposite. She's able to turn out to others. How can I love others? How can I be there for others? Um, and that that is a great lesson for us of how to even alleviate, um, even if not alleviate, but uh, just like change our focus uh, outside of ourselves during the time of, of pain or suffering. Yeah. One of the great stories I like from this period is the um, there's the one doctor who who is there for a short time and then the main doctor comes he's on vacation or something like that so mm-hmm. he has his colleague fill in for him while he's away and then um, you know weeks pass by and similar situation this doctor comes back that uh, Elizabeth had only met once I think and mm-hmm. you know immediately started asking him questions about his family and and you know picking up right where they left off a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago and so this this witness of and he he writes about this experience with with Elizabeth, even though he only spent a few hours with her. Mm -hmm. uh, He has this great testimony to bear to the saint who, um, who who brought him his bought him peace when when he was tasked with bringing her peace within respect to his profession. Yeah. And maybe it's my sort of like, uh, skeptical nature, but I find these are the the witnesses that are most believable to me about the life of, of Elizabeth, because you know, you have her sisters who live with her and like, maybe they really want her to be a saint. So they're going to say really good things about her or her family. You know, they love her. They want to say really good things about her. They want her to be a saint, you know, but here after Elizabeth's deaths, we have these, this doctor, you know, at least one of them wasn't even a believer. So Mm -hmm. he had, he had no interest in necessarily like seeing her canonized. He's just stating the, the facts of his experience of her. And he was just so blown away by, um, by Elizabeth's love in the midst of great pain and suffering. Yeah, I, I know. I mean, from my own experience, you know, working with people who are ill and, um, you know, you hear all these stories, too, of priests who work in hospitals and just some of the the um, faith breaks through those places and um, experiences and miracles happen all the time. And uh, it's often, um, you know, it's often for the sake of the people who, who maybe have lost their faith, who are, you know, passing through that mm. that place or work there. And so just a, it's a testimony to just how how God how good God is, mm-hmm. and um, and maybe maybe your suffering is is an opportunity to to bring Christ to somebody who has lost their faith, um, and it's just a reminder for us to always to always bear Christ with us no matter what's going on internally or or um, or you know within our bodies. Yeah, and that's actually a, a great transition to what the kind of major things that happen to Elizabeth next. So this is um, now we're talking May. Um, and, and Elizabeth had her second, like major attack where she lost consciousness again. And, um, this is really kind of in some sense, the beginning of the end, because, uh, from this point on it's, she's able to eat next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, so from this point, it's kind of this gradual decline where there seems to be no coming back. Right. You start to see probably within the sort of what's going on physiologically, probably the failing of the adrenal glands in in more of a a serious sense to the extent where she's, yeah, not able to eat. She's, she's up all night. She's up all day, you know, Mm -hmm. unable to sleep. And, um, and just so uh, the beginning of, of a lot of profound suffering for her, but still, you know, it's, she's writing, she's, she's, um, her spirit is, is very, 
is very high and you know she's she's ready she's happy because she's gonna she's going to go to heaven <laughs> right yeah and it's just 10 days after that attack or close to about 10 days after that um she experiences probably the most profound mm. uh spiritual grace of her life which i think we mentioned um on a previous episode the last last episode the last episode yeah this connects to what you were just saying about how elizabeth was was able in the midst of this to be so conformed to to christ in the midst of the the pain that she was going through yeah yeah so th- this is the the what we alluded to or we spoke about at the end of the last episode which was her intellectual vision of the of the trinity mm-hmm. um and so this was an i think it'd be good to, to also mention here the the, the practice of mother germain because mm-hmm. it's kind of relevant to this yes. story um so because elizabeth was unable to eat anything she was unable to receive communion and uh, mother germain uh she just sounds like a fascinating just an incredible woman mm-hmm. um fascinating woman just a woman of, of such care and love um what she would do is after she received communion she would go and do her thanksgiving um next to elizabeth uh, yeah. so that elizabeth could be with the presence of the blessed sacrament uh, very close to the presence of the blessed sacrament it's such a gentle and motherly thing to do um when when elizabeth was unable to receive herself and so she's able to make these spiritual communions mm-hmm. in the absence of being able to receive um, we have to remember at that time that you didn't receive communion in the context of mass it would be after mass that you would receive and so she would just come straight up after receiving or the nuns would go back probably to their choir stalls to pray uh, mother germain would just excuse herself and go go give her thanksgiving next to elizabeth so that she could be present to the blessed sacrament yeah and elizabeth would just could then sit there and adore the christ that's dwelling within uh mother germain yeah so in this particular instance uh, mother germain couldn't for whatever reason she wasn't able to make it up and so it was a few hours before mother germain was able to check in on elizabeth that day and it it's a, during that absence of uh, the Blessed Sacrament, uh, that normal routine, I guess, that had probably built up over the course of a few weeks that um, is when, uh, well, this would have been, this wouldn't have been a few weeks. This would have been this, well, Easter season, right? Because this is Ascension Thursday. Um, so the end of the Easter season, and, um, and Elizabeth uh, experiences this intellectual vision of the, of the Trinity within her, the Trinity communicating within her. Um, yeah, yeah. Her own description of that is she says, um, that she saw the three divine persons holding their counsel of love within me. Yeah. Which again, I think, I mean, we maybe we maybe went into it a little bit in the last episode, but uh, I think it's important to say that when she says that she saw the three persons, this is an intellectual vision, which means it's it. She she didn't see anything in the sense of like with her eyes. Um, see is just like you know. Even we say that when you understand something, like oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that's more close of what what it means. It's like. An intellectual vision. It's hard to it's hard to even try to explain something like this. But she just had this very profound um, sense of reality of the reality of the Holy Trinity within her. And John of the Cross would say, you know, this kind of vision, this intellectual vision, is one um, that is much more much more interior and much more lasting mm-hmm. of of a type of vision than if she had seen something of the Trinity with her bodily eyes. It's it's as memorable as having seen. I think that's why it's called a vision because it's not just a, an exercise of the imagination or kind of like a picture in your head sort of thing. It's it's more uh, of a of a uh, of a lasting, memorable sort of experience. Um, and even yeah, even more lasting, I think, than even yeah. having seen. I would say because this marks a huge transition in the spiritual life of Elizabeth, where suddenly it's it's as though for the rest of her life, basically, uh, except for maybe a short period right before her death, maybe even in that though, um, where she she was always aware of and, and present to the Holy Trinity mm-hmm. dwelling within her. Yeah, it, it, yeah, significant change. And, and we, would see, we would see that in some of the, the later writings, later treatises that she would write, some of these things that we've already spoken about, the retreat that she wrote for Sister Geet, Heaven and Faith, mm-hmm. um, the, the note that she wrote for Mother Germain. Um, at, in, in, uh, I think both of those are happening in, in August and September and October. Um, uh, Let yourself be loved. And mm-hmm. so the... The presence of the Trinity within her even comes out to the, through her pen, you know? Yes. Yeah, and what strikes me about this whole experience is, like, this is the reality Elizabeth has been talking about mm-hmm. before this, of the indwelling of the Trinity. Um, so she knew that this was the case before. Like, through our baptism, this is the case for us. So this this vision is not necessarily something totally new. It's it's a, the vision of it is, the experience of it is, maybe. But she's it's, a, it's a just... Um, kind of the certitude of the reality that she already knew was the case in her soul and is already the case in our souls too. Yeah. Do you think it'd be good to talk a little bit about kind of the 
because it would the contrast to this would, be, would play important later on of of this experience as a consolation for her. Mm. Yeah, um, it certainly was right, um, but it's it's uh, it, it would be. You know, later on, it, as she was approaching her death, she would not be experiencing, she would be experiencing the absence of things like this, yeah. uh, particularly this intellectual vision. Um, and she would even have to kind of fight for maybe a little, that might be too strong of a word, for kind of a, an understanding of uh, her conformity to Christ within respect of her suffering. But here is something that God is, is freely giving to her in grace as a consolation mm-hmm. um, and, and something that... Uh, you know, I think is important, was important for her in, in this stage in, in terms of being able to get through some of the more desolate, darker times. Right. But, and, and even in the dark times though, she knew in faith, she yeah. knew that this was the reality. And that's yeah. the whole thing again of, of heaven and faith is that we too, through faith can know that, that this is true in our own souls. Um, so when we don't feel it, when we don't experience it in sort of a tangible way, in fact, when we experience very much the opposite, um, when we make these acts of faith, we can still say, no, like, um, I'm a beloved son of God. The Holy Trinity dwells within me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think for her, that, that having received that consolation uh, gave her a certain sense of certitude of the presence of God within her, even when, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of, of dryness and darkness at the mm-hmm. end of her life. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so another maybe interesting um, shift intellectually for her at this time is she encounters uh, two mystics, uh, the writings of mm. two mystics, and it's it's kind of almost seems random to me, but <laughs> but actually they're both 14th century or around 14th century. They're mystics, so they're 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 speaking about kind of the mysteries of of God and union with God and and um, contemplation and heaven. So so there is perhaps some connection here, but um, one is uh, Roy's Brock, who was a yeah fourteenth century Flemish mix, mm-hmm. mystic and the blessed. other he's beatified blessed oh blessed yeah blessed uh, John Roisbrock John yes and then um, the other is um, Angela uh, Feligno of of Feligno. of Feligno of Feligno yeah and she's Italian mm-hmm. um, around the same time period right yeah and and uh, yeah it is kind of arbitrary or random that that these two but for whatever reason um, it, the, the Roysbrook in particular had become kind of at the time a a uh, I don't know a lot of the sisters were reading him and were finding a lot of profit from them. So it, this you can see how this happens. You know, even with your own families, you know, someone gets obsessed with a certain author and that's all they talk about. And so okay, okay finally I'll read this person, right? Yeah. So you can only imagine how that compounds in a religious community uh, where they hand the book off to you <laughs> and it's, yeah. Yeah, and and even so, we have to remember too the the God's mystery in all of this too. That it could be that there was a particular affinity for this saint uh, within this community, and and so the intercession of the saints, the power of the intercession of the saints, mm-hmm. being present as well. Yeah, it's interesting because I read uh, Roy's Brock a little bit back, uh, maybe it's like five years ago, just because you know I was studying Elizabeth, yeah. and I love Elizabeth, so I wanted to read everything that Elizabeth <laughs> read, and uh, I remember reading it, and it was just. It was nice, um, but it wasn't. I wasn't having the same experience that she was when when she was reading him. So, um, it's interesting. Like you know, again, certain saints read, speak to us at yeah. different times, and I wasn't where Elizabeth was, mm-hmm. so I couldn't expect it to have the same impact on me necessarily. One of the things that really seemed to strike her about, uh, well, I think I think both of these saints is their focus on the interior mm-hmm. life, which is something that was speaking to Elizabeth, you know, all throughout this time, but. Um, also, the the words of uh, of Angela about suffering. There was I don't remember exactly how she got this. If someone, I think one of the sisters maybe told her one of these this sentence or, or this phrase um, of Angela, and it was, "Where then did he dwell but in suffering?" Yeah, and something that's so simple and and so scriptural, mm-hmm. nothing like sh- crazy new, right? Where did where then did he dwell but in suffering? But it was yeah. something that would just open up like totally new horizons for Elizabeth based on where she was at this point in her yeah, life. Yeah, Mother Germain calls this a turning point when she was exposed to the writings of, of Angela Fligno in the sense of this, um, the Christical, Christological mystery of suffering, death and suffering, and, and, um, and something that uh, would become, like I said, she, she's something that she was ripe to be grappling with uh, mm-hmm. at the end of her life. And, um, you know, something that would become a, a prominent part of, of the retreat that she would make in August. 
Right. Yeah. And so this, this is where, you know, I think through the, these, these saints, um, or through these writing, the writings of these mystics, and then through her own experience, we see in Elizabeth and this really blossoming spirituality of suffering that's mm -hmm. coming forth. Um, and like we said before, I think the, the primary, like focus of all of this for her is this conformity to Christ. Yeah. That is, is why suffering can even have any sort of meaning or purpose is because it can form her to the life of, of her beloved. And it's so, it's so appropriate with respect to the mystery of death because of the, the need for us, all of us, no matter whether we're dying or whether we have many years to live of, of, um, of losing, losing ourselves so that we can find ourselves in Christ. You know, mm -hmm. it's that whole mystery of, of dying to oneself and, and, and putting on Christ. And of course, this would also be the time in the infirmary where Elizabeth would be profoundly uh, reading the, the writings of St. Paul as well. And, yeah. and uh, from a theo maybe more of a theological perspective, getting that uh, put into that mix of, of authors that she was reading. Right. And, and I mean, suffering is such an it's a huge topic, right? I mean, it's it's been written on countless, you know, countless books, and um, it's one that you can never totally explain, a mystery that you can never totally explain. Um, but it does seem so clear to me that that suffering is one of those mysteries that without faith, like su both of these things that we're talking about in this episode, really suffering and death, are just these great tragedies. Um, and it's really, it's, it's hard to find any source of, of light or goodness in the midst of them without mm -hmm. the eyes of faith. And yet uh, Elizabeth, as she's going through this, so this isn't just some uh, like ideal in her mind that um, she's living it. It's very different, you know, to when you're living the pain to be able to, to experience and say these things. And yet she's really able to, um, to, to develop this spirituality and, and find meaning in the midst of, of her suffering. Yeah, yeah, that, um, that to dwell. I mean, this is the, it brings in the whole mystery of her, of her name again, too, mm -hmm. you know, that, that to be the dwelling place of God, Elizabeth of the Trinity, the, um, the house of God and, and the house of the Trinity, um, you know, the second person of the Trinity being the one who became man and suffered. Um, it, it's, it's finding a home for the suffering Christ in the midst of that, that mystery, which was her, her whole life. Yeah, and, and she would even call, um, you know, the, her letters from this time are just incredible to me. These are, uh, her, her letters from this time in the infirmary mm -hmm. are just, there's so much there. There's so much beauty, um, so much mystery. And it's something too, when you read, you're like, you're being formed by it. But at the same time, you realize it's something so far beyond what I'm even capable of. Um, but she writes these yeah, incredibly beautiful letters where she's talking a lot about suffering and a lot about sharing um, in the suffering of Christ and, and what that means uh, for her spiritually. And there's one really beautiful letter where she um, is writing to her mother. This is letter 314, and she's telling her mother about uh, the, the suffering that she's going through. She, she's able to experience things and suffering, and when she says them, it just sounds almost crazy to me <laughs> what she's saying. But... Um, uh, she, she writes to her, her mother about this experience. She says, more and more I'm drawn to suffering. This desire almost surpasses the one for heaven, though that was very strong. Never has God made me understand so well that suffering is the greatest pledge of love he can give his creature. So again, like without the eyes of faith, this is like a sort of masochism, right? It's like she's like wanting pain or suffering. But no, it's it's all like love is at the center of it all. She realizes that it's this pledge of love. Um, she's able to, to, to uh, receive the love of the beloved and, and give love to him back in this experience of her, her, um, her pain. It's also a sharing in the life of the Trinity, again, in that incarnational sense that mm -hmm. she's able to experience what one of the three experienced. Um, you know, without what that idea wouldn't have been lost on her and in something that's that uh, particularly because of that experience that she had had at, at a, on the the, ascend, the the feast of the ascension, mm -hmm. that uh, that God was God was uh, with her. She's suffering. She's suffering with Christ, and this is this is a union with Christ. This is a union with with the one of the three. Yeah, and in a way that it, that had not been been for her in the past as a young woman. Right. 
yeah, yeah, we see we do see a progression here too, where she's able to she's so much desired heaven before this, and yet here she's able to say, you know, I'm even even desiring this more than heaven because yeah. she, there's this just great conformity with with Christ in it. And there's this appreciation too for for the having been able to suffer. You know, we so many people die tragically. Um, you know, even even outside the context of something, you know, we say, oh, well, they didn't suffer or something like that. We see that as some good, right, mm. for that person. Um, and, and to an extent, you know, we don't want to get too much into that, but it's it's this idea that that um, you know she she did value something of this experience and, and something that I think if if she were given the option, uh, would you rather die now or would you rather suffer some more? And, and we hear this in Elizabeth, we hear it in Therese. It's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'll, oh, keep, it's really, I'll keep suffering. <laughs> it's really, yeah, it's really God's will, right? Yeah. God's will be done no matter what that is. It's yeah. not uh, accepting pain and suffering for its own sake. Um, right. Not it's not it this masochistic all. sort of thing, but it's, it's a sense of like, well, they understand that, you know, it is God's will. They are not to die right now. Yes. It's all I always laugh when I hear in, in the last conversations, particularly of St. Therese, her sisters mm-hmm. saying this constantly. It's like, would you let it rest? You know, <laughs> she's, she's content in doing God's will. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Whatever that might be. Um, and so much so that, you know, Elizabeth's even able to say that she can see every joy and every suffering as this kind of gift coming to her from from mm. her beloved yeah well let's turn now maybe to um something that we we mentioned before but this is one of her major spiritual writings was her last retreat yeah and um she wrote this at the end of the month of august from august 15th to 31st the 31st um and it's interesting because this is you know this this last retreat is exactly like it the, the title says it's the last retreat that she'll do she says it's kind of her her preparation for heaven her novitiate for heaven um here in the last few months of her life and i mean one thing that might be a little different about this retreat right is she's in an infirmary Mm -hmm. so it's not like she can go off and and have total silence or be totally away from everyone else she's still in the infirmary um she's still having to see doctors she's still having to interact with some of the sisters i think even her her mother uh comes visited yeah 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 so her life is kind of going on, and yet mm-hmm. interiorly, this is a real time of retreat for her. Well, one of the one of the kind of the circumstances of that is that was her sleeplessness, mm-hmm. um, and so she would have long periods at night where no one was bothering her, but where she couldn't sleep, uh, and it was usually during these time these times when she would she would be writing jotting these things down during the context of these sixteen days. Yeah, and and one maybe big difference here, we, you know, we talked about the um, the heaven and faith, which was kind mm-hmm. of a retreat she wrote for her sister in the first half of August, and yet here we have in the second half of August her last retreat. Um, they're they're similar in structure perhaps, but this is really more of like her spiritual autobiography or spiritual diary of sorts, because yeah. it's what she's actually experiencing that she's writing down. The, the other was to teach her sister, to guide her sister. I mean, not that it is totally, you know, disjointed from her own experience, but it had a different goal where this was really like, you can see this progression of what's happening interiorly in her life. And it's very phenomenological too, because in the, in the sense of that there's this, um, there's this, be- this, the state of becoming within this retreat, because she's grappling with the idea of um, the spiritual insight that she's been given to be a praise of of, of his glory, mm-hmm. um, and she she doesn't quite she loves that phrase and she's writing it frequently in letters and things like that. But she's she wants to she wants to bring out a resolution maybe for the end of her life out of it. She wants to bring out um, a, a spirituality of of what this means. And so the retreat, the last retreat, is really kind of um, it's really yeah this grappling with these ideas and trying to 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 birth um, mm-hmm. an understanding of, of uh, in, in terms of, in, in I think the, the idea of labor works in that as well too, this idea of trying to labor through mm-hmm. um, both her suffering, but also with trying to grasp the sense of what it is that God is calling her to be, what is her vocation. You can really kind of compare it in many ways to, to Manuscript B of, of St. Therese, mm-hmm. uh, this, this, um, this sort of grappling with, um, and even, I think even Therese kind of has more of an idea of what she's writing at before she writes it, but, uh, um, yeah, you can really see kind of as the days go by of, of uh, Elizabeth trying to, to gain a better understanding of what God desires for her in her vocation at the end of her life. Yeah, and if you, if you um, 
read this last retreat, you see that Elizabeth brought all of her best friends with her <laughs> on retreat. So, but in a different way from heaven and faith. Yes, because in in heaven and faith, she was really quoting, and she was because she was it's for someone else, and so she can't she can't quote someone, and, and the person would immediately know. Okay, this she's she's referring to Royce Brooke, or she's referring to Paul here. So she was more explicit, and uh, I think even Mother Germain gave her some instruction. You know, mm -hmm. she said, okay, you can you can have this retreat period, but. Uh, Make sure you you write things down, and she had a she had a motive in mind. You know, she she knows that Elizabeth is dying, that she's going to have to write. It's a very again similarity to the story of a soul in, in yes. Therese's life that uh, she's going to have to um, write this circular letter to go out to the nuns, and she wants something that's more testimonial. Yes, from Elizabeth. Yeah. Right, right. So we still see a lot of quotations, especially from Saint Paul, from the Gospels, um, even from from Royce Brooke and others. But um, I'd say it's almost like. Uh, Elizabeth begins to come out a little stronger, right. her more original thinking, or she takes a little more freedom in in um, not even in interpreting the authors. I mean, she's using these other authors to to say the things that she's experiencing, mm -hmm. but it's really original. It's it's her experience. It's her realities. Yeah, there's gonna, there's more I statements mm -hmm. in in the last retreat because yeah. she's really she's really bearing more of herself into these things. Right, and and one thing that strikes me from um, the entire retreat is there seems to be this kind of simplification almost. Uh, it's interesting because I find in my own spiritual life at times things seem to get more and more complicated <laughs> over time. And then I'll sometimes have these flashes of just simplicity and, and realize like, why was I making that so hard? Um, but I think as the saints seem to get holier and holier, it seems like they're just moving towards this mm -hmm. simplification. And it, it really just ends with this idea of like, yeah, this conformity to Christ. Like, yeah. it's just a simple, I mean, it's not, of course, easy, but it's just this very, just going back to the roots of the gospel, what does it mean to be a praise of his glory? What does it mean to be a saint? It means to live the life of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's that's everything. That's that's um, that's Jesus in, in, in glory and in, in heaven, you know, in the, in the resurrection. It's um, it's Jesus in, in suffering. Right. Um, and and it's it's that full conformity. And uh, one section of the retreat, which is, I think, one of my favorite parts is, um, I think, it, uh, days five through eight of the retreat, where she's, she's for whatever reason, she's finding herself in, in the book of Revelation, which is one of my favorite books of the New Testament. Um, and she's uh, she's she's bringing all these themes of of um, of sacrifice and. Um, and uh, of the meaning, the true meaning of virginity and, and of, of being really just pure of everything except Christ. Um, and so it, there, there's, there's a, so much beauty in here. I think, um, you know, one thing to, to bear in mind, too, is that she had this experience um, in the infirmary. And they had these uh, galleries, I guess you could call them, that were off the infirmary where the priest could go up the stairs in order to, to give communion. But there was also a little place to sit and pray, and it was um, it was directly directly parallel to um, kind of on the same level as a tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And so Elizabeth, in, in moments during the the summer and the early fall when she was able to move, she would spend time in prayer in this little gallery above the sanctuary of the of the chapel. Um, and she she um, she has kind of this insight of being of being the queen at the right side from the from from one of the psalms. Uh, the queen has stood at your right hand in gold of Ophir, you know, the psalm. And um, she she just has this, this, this insight into walking alongside Christ mm -hmm. and, and all of the, the, that he does, whether it be the, the elect in, in the book of Revelation who are following along the path of, of, of the faithful and true one on the, you know, seated on the horse and mm -hmm. um, or whether it be walking through the Via Dolorosa, you know, this the way of the cross and the, and the passion and suffering of him. She has this experience and this insight of, of, of herself walking, walking along Christ's side at this time in her life. And, and, and she brings this out in, in the retreat as well. She says, she walks the way of Calvary at the right of her crucified, annihilated, humiliated king, yet always so strong, so calm, so full of majesty as he goes to his passion to make the glory of his grace blaze forth. And so... You know, this is the this this is Christ in glory, Christ on the cross. This is the great mystery that's so present in John's gospel too. But the idea of, of the glorification, the the the, the King being elevated on is on the cross, and the mystery of that, and to be a praise of His glory is to is to experience that and to praise Him, to be the praise of His glory on the cross as well. 
yeah, to enter into that reality with him. That reminds me too of this idea that what seems to be happening interiorly in Elizabeth, I mean, physically interiorly is with her during this time is it's almost like she would describe it in these words too, as though she's being consumed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like God is, you know, this great love, fire of love. Um, and and she's, it's like everything within her is being consumed from the inside out. Cause she has, you know, when she um, is unable to eat, she has these stomach ulcers and then she has all this inflammation and, you know, they're giving her all this, they're trying everything. Like, what can you eat? Have a little bit of milk or have this chocolate or whatever it might be that she can try to get. I think at the end, she was just eating like a few grains of sugar even. They're trying yeah. to get something down, but even water when she would, it would just like burn her from the inside. So she's having this experience of, of being consumed by God. And she's reading the live and flame of love at this time of John, St. John on the cross. And so she's experiencing this fire of God's love in a kind of physical way within her that's just consuming her. And, um, you know, we have, there's a, a photograph of her towards the end of her life. And when you see her, it's kind of horrifying <laughs> um, because she's become, she's just wasted away basically. Yeah. And yet you can, you can tell like this is someone who's, who's been consumed. Yeah. It's amazing, you know, people say oh, I'm going on retreat in, in what that kind of means in modern society. It's like, well, I have to go find myself or something like that. You hear that kind of in, in modern parlance, right? I, I need to go find myself. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth goes on this last retreat in order to lose herself. Yes. And it's to lose herself in, in the identity of, of the crucified. Yeah, and to give everything that she is to, yeah. to him. And so much so that, um, I mean, everything means really everything. And so at the end, very end of her life here, we have... Um, the beginning of November, she receives communion for the last time on All Saints Day. And then the very next day, she goes into a great uh, spiritual and psychological darkness. Mm-hmm. So even that is something that she's going to to give over to the Lord at the end. And um, the one of the things that happens is that she begins to, uh, or at least perhaps maybe fear that she might be tempted to suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, she says, makes this comment to Mother Germaine of like, well, do you, you know, do you really want to leave me here alone? And she like indicates to the window. And Mother Germaine isn't sure what she's talking about. But then later on, she, I think the next day, she explains to the doctor how um, she says that uh, for the first time she could, she could understand why someone would be drawn to suicide because of the, the, the great, imp- the physical pain, but also the, the psychological and spiritual elements that are going into this too. Yeah, the impatience of knowing this is going to happen, why can't it happen now, mm-hmm. right? And, and so that, that sense of we, something we can't really relate to until we experience it ourselves or if we experience it ourselves. And so it's a, I think it's that it, it, there's that always an importance to bear, you know, bear, bear patiently with those who are suffering such that, yes. um, that this goes to their mind. It's not a lack of faith. It's just it's, it's a sense of... of um, you know what goes through go, what goes through one's mind in the midst of this. You know, and and How somehow long? Elizabeth was able to keep faith through this because she even says she describes her interior state at one point. She says it's like believing there is no God, mm-hmm. but it's interesting words because she says it's like believing. So there's still like this, just this ounce of faith in her. It's like everything within her, physically, mentally, spiritually, psychologically, everything saying like there is no God, and yet in the like depth of her soul there's she's still holding on to that faith like no there there is a god yeah. and he loves me um and then added to this too is i think this is really just amazing is during these days she goes through um, a physical night too in the sense of i think her eyes get so inflamed that she can't see anything either mm-hmm. so she's just in total darkness now yeah and i think it's it's it, it speaks to kind of this i the theological idea of kenosis of the emptying of christ on the cross and that he gives everything for the sake of humanity everything of himself. Um, God gave everything to us mm-hmm. uh, on the cross. And, and so, um, you know, similarly, I think in our own known mystery of our life and death, that this is something that, um, that, that happens. It's a purification. Um, and it's something that, that's, that's important for a mysterious reason. You know, it's, yeah. there's, a myst- there's a, myst- a mystery within that, that kind of uh, emptying of everything uh, within us, even what we held on to dearly in our, in our life of faith. Yeah, and only if we could, if only we could see the the thing, little things in our life or big things that are taken away with this same this same light though of mm. of faith of saying like, again, this is terrible, and it's painful, and yet um, you're with me in it, Jesus, and and I'm I'm even thankful for it because somehow you're going to bring bring good out of this. Right, right. 
and and the experience that the way that Elizabeth describes it is she says it seems as though my body were suspended and my soul in darkness. So it really is just like this total conformity to Christ on the cross here. These are the final few days of her life. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and even within the the even within this this ugliness this absence of of all sort of semblance of of uh, of uh, you know mysticism I guess you could say this nothingness which which is honestly very close to, to what most of the mystics experience and and the kind of the 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 purification of of knowledge and of um, you know worldly knowledge and even concepts of God and, and faith uh, aspects of faith that that we kind of hold on to that this is. Um, you know, also integral to her spirituality of being the praise of, of glory. Even in this, she's able to, she, she desires to be that praise of the glory. And um, the last few days, not to go back all the way to the, the last retreat, but just to say the last few days of that retreat are all about resolutions. And mm -hmm. this is also, you know, this is a good spiritual insight for us who go on retreats. If you go on a retreat to make sure that you're, you're making some resolution out of that retreat. And even in, in Elizabeth's last retreat, there's this resolution of, uh, of abandonment, of, of giving everything um, that would probably help her during this time, mm -hmm. uh, particularly of this darkness. Yes, yeah. So then just a few days later, um, November 9th is finally when Elizabeth uh, dies. And, and I mean, it's totally conformed to Christ in, in his death, but then also um, in, in his resurrection in, in heaven. And her last words are, I'm going to light, to love, to life. Mm. So, of course, um, you know, after death, the saints have a long legacy to live. And it's been 112 years since her death. You know, this has been a time that is um, where she's influenced so many. You know, we, we speak of, uh, we've spoken earlier in the season of uh, the writings of, you know, a great theologian like Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, we spoke of, of her presence within the Catechism of the Catholic Church that was written in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, published in 92. Um, and so even, even though she was beatified, she's beatified in 1984, um, and it would be several, you know, several decades before she'd be canonized, uh, even as a blessed, you know, I first heard of her as blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity, and uh, because her canonization was as recent as 2016. Um, and so her legacy is one of, of great profundity in the church, particularly with respect to the mystery of the Trinity and, and, and how that mystery is, is capable, is, is possible and, and ought to <laughs> live within our own life. Maybe, maybe a quick story about her canonization in 2016. When I first entered the monastery, she was blessed Elizabeth as well. And I read her writings when I first came and I really fell in love with her. And I said, um, when I heard that, you know, she she might be canonized. I was kind of hoping that she wouldn't because I didn't want to share her with others. But I remember the day she was canonized. I, I remember was, it too. I was so happy to share her with, with everyone in the world. So I, she really does have a very important message, uh, I think, for the world right now when it comes to this life of interiority, of prayer, of knowing our dignity as, as um, participants in the, the Most Holy Trinity. So we thank you for joining us this season and may God bless you.